Today we're going to talk about stiffness because there's a fantastic article in the Cyclist magazine where they've interviewed a few frame designers and they're talking about bike frame stiffness. And it's really, really fascinating look at some of the design decisions that are being forced upon engineers, if you like. And when I read it, um, I kept looking at other, other bikes in the, in the workshop and thinking, that's great, but wheels. <laughs> and I'll come to that in a second. I just wanna run through roughly what this article is about. And I really do recommend going to check it out. So what it's about is about sort of three, I think it's three engineers that they're talking to and talking through how you test it, what is stiffness, what is compliance, you know, because if you believe quite a lot of cycling journalists just want stiffer frame, stiffer frame, and stiffer means faster, uh, or they want endurance bikes should be compliant, and I'm trying to think what is compliant actually mean. And they're trying to put this into numbers, measure it, put it on testing rigs, trying to get an understanding of what's going on and what affects it, which is where the R&D is happening with those big brands. And generally speaking, they're describing a stiffer frame as being a bit like running in barefoot or jumping onto a pavement as opposed to jumping on a, onto a trampoline. I think we can all understand that. And if anyone's had an overly stiff frame or wheels, you'll know what I mean. It just feels like you're being bounced around like old time trial bikes, you know, this 19 millimeter tires. It felt like you're going really fast in the same way that riding a go-kart feels really fast. You know, your eyeballs are shattering and you're, you know, compared to a sports car, for instance, which might have some compliance built in so that it works with the racetrack and it bends and flexes in all the right place, a bit more like the, the Bugatti Veyron or something where it's got the suspension just absolutely tuned in perfectly and the aerodynamics are all tuned perfectly. So that's what they're trying to do, is to try and get the, the feeling of going fast, but also the confidence that comes with something that's got some flex and compliance. And they're talking about two um, two aspects of this. So one is the sort of relationship between the back wheel and the front wheel flexing like this, which is pretty important for handling. And the best way of describing that is if, if, if you ski, you'll understand because if you push into the ski, the ski flexes and it's that curve that makes, that makes the turn. And if you've ever watched like really, really good skiers, they can ski such beautiful carved lines, get over so steep that their shoulders are almost touching the mountain. You know, it looks effortless, but there's, if you know you're a skier, how much force that skier is producing to get that ski to bend and to carve a, carve a turn. Same thing if you watch Tom Pidcock's descent, which is absolutely mind blowing, how much he's leaning that bike over. And it looks effortless and flowy, like he's got balls of steel, but he'll tell you, he's putting an immense amount of force through those pedals to get that bike to hold that line. And that's where that flex comes from is you, flexing that and then you need to pop out of it, you move your hips. I'll try and put some footage on that and just see, highlight what it is I mean. Now, most cyclists don't do that. <laughs> most cyclists ski how most skiers ski and they don't actually put anywhere near that sort of force through a frame. And this is especially true once you get down into the smaller sizes and the lighter riders. So I think one of the real tricks that they're probably not mentioned in here is Okay, that might be great for a size 56 frame and a 70 kilo rider or whatever, but that's gonna be very, very different to someone on a 58 or a 60 centimeter frame who weighs maybe 80, 90 kilos. And what about the 45, 50 kilo rider on a size 48 frame? You gotta make sure that they have the same ride characteristics across that broad range of sizes. That's quite hard to do is to get that same same ratio. So these guys say that they've come up with like a magic ratio of 50-50 between the, the flex here and the flex between the bottom bracket, the lateral flex. Now the lateral flex is probably what we get most hung up about. I know that when people go out ride and they're out of the saddle and they can see their bottom bracket swaying or maybe even the tires touching stays and they feel like the frame is really, really flexible. That's what most people get sort of hung up on because it feels like pedaling efficiency is being sucked away from you. And I totally, totally get that. It's really obvious. I used to have a, uh, a bike, I think it was a pro bike kit. It's one of those open mold things. Um, and oh my God, it was so flexible. I could not ride it out of the saddle. The second I sort of got out of the saddle, the bike would just flex so much. It was, it was insane. I remember trying so many different types of wheels, thinking it might be the wheels, but it was just the frame was so flexy. I think we've moved on from that now. I think we're at the point where even 
sort of the copycat frames, the open molds, have got an understanding that they need to make things stiff. They might achieve it a different way by adding material. And we have definitely seen uh, frames like the guys in this article explain where there's been like some, <laughs> sometimes like half a millimeter thick of carbon in, in like the bottom bracket areas to trying to get it to stiff it up, which is why sometimes you've got to scratch your head and think, hang on, this carbon frame weighs almost as much as this aluminium frame. It's because they've just been adding material trying to get everything stiffened up without having to resort to higher modulus uh, carbon fiber. Now, what's interesting is, uh, once I've started talking about the whole stiffness thing, which is, which is fascinating, is the, des the design decisions that they're sort of forced into. And I was sort of picturing this in my mind and having a whole lot of empathy for these poor designers because they, imagine if you're a frame designer, right? And you've been putting all your engineering knowledge and all your research into developing a frame and you've, um, you've got all the aerodynamics sorted and then you've been working with another team to try and get the stiffness uh, and the flex and the compliance all sorted and you've got it on jigs, you've got it measured and you've been working with the factory as to how you can achieve this aerodynamics and stiffness ratios with certain types of carbon layups and how you engineer the price to where you need it to be as well because that is still ultimately <laughs> a deciding factor. There's no point doing all of this work if the frame comes out at six and a half thousand pounds and, and nobody buys it. And cost engineering is actually a really important part of what these guys do. Um, but you can imagine <laughs> like the, <laughs> the room, can't you? When you've, you've developed a frame, you've been working with the factory, you've been working really hard and it's like, okay, I've got this frame, it's good. And you sort of get together and the sort of the product manager is saying, that's great, right, we need to add an Ultegra group set to that. Ultegra group set costs this much, bang, bolt that to the price. Handlebars, bolt that in. You know, saddle, etc. bolt that in. And I can imagine going like, Ugh, what's our target price? What does the price of this bike need to be to actually sell? Because if it's too expensive, no matter how good it is, people won't buy it. Um, it has to be at a certain price point. And this is where I think the poor guy who's in charge of wheels, <laughs> I can imagine the type of guy he is, probably wearing like a, a shirt and he's got a beard and you know expert on wheels and he's probably looking around the room and going oh god okay <laughs> what do I do now to try and get a set of wheels to complement this frame but with no budget left and I think this is the massive problem facing you as buyers you go into a bike shop and you see these fantastic frames and uh, all the marketing spiel is probably quite right, but does that transfer into what you experience? Probably not, because the wheels have been compromised all too often to get to the price point. That's the thing that um, that's the thing that they really <sighs> compromise on. And of course, you get into the, when you get the bike that's got the right wheels and the right group set and everything is you know right. The price is just too high. Um, and as a result, you compromise and compromise. And you got to wonder, what was the point <laughs> of designing a frame like that just to dump wheels on it? And actually, would we have been better off with a, uh, a cheaper, more compromised frame that we can then put be better wheels on? And that's the argument that goes on and on and on uh, with all our customers. In fact, if you can recall, the Sonelli Veltrix is a fantastic example of this because the Sonelli Veltrix actually, it's nicely engineered, it's nicely finished, um, but it is heavy. You know, compared to an aluminium bike, it's not all that much lighter than an aluminium bike because uh, it's got quite a lot of material in it, but it is quite a nice sort of compliant bike. But because it's a bit cheaper, it means that we can then up-spec the wheels. Uh, I think as a total package, you end up with a better bike for the money because most of that stiffness and compliance you can you can get from your wheels. I'm gonna put in some B-roll footage here so you can get an idea of what I mean between those, those stiffness arguments. So yeah, this is um, the, t the, key, <laughs> the key takeaway from, from this video is when you're considering a, a bike, I need, you need to consider those two things as a package, they need to be married, they need to work together to combine the thing. Like If they're mismatched, they'll be fighting against each other. You'll have a stiff bike and compliant wheels, or you have a compliant bike and stiff wheels, and they need to work together. The, the two things really are 
intertwined in a way that I really do not think that a lot of manufacturers are considerate to at the price point that we're all probably at, you know, the sort of the, the high volume sales of bike. I don't think that marriage happens very, very often. What do you think? <laughs> um, have, you, have you had this situation? Have you brought a bike, you know, read all the marketing spiel only to be a bit disappointed and then found that if you changed your wheels, it changed everything? Or have you found a bike from the shelf that had that magic formula built in from the start? I'd be, I'd be really keen to know. Um, read through the article. Did, <laughs> did you find it as interesting as I did? And yeah, again, just, just add, to, add to the dialogue below. I think the best thing about this YouTube channel is your comments. Okay, thanks for listening, everybody. Think about subscribing to the channel and I'll see you on the next one.